In celebration of maybe the best first overall pick in the history of the NHL's 37th birthday, Hunter and I are going to take a stab at power ranking the last 10 first overall picks. Your Locked On NHL, your daily podcast on the National Hockey League. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's edition of Locked On NHL. My name is Nick Sararis. I'm the host of Locked On Oilers. That is Hunter Hodes, one of the co-hosts of Locked On Penguins. We want to thank everybody who makes Locked On NHL their first listen of the day. Locked On NHL, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms do apply. So, Hunter, yesterday, Sidney Crosby turned thirty-seven years old. Sidney Crosby, widely considered the best player of his era, considered one of the greatest players of, of all time, and frankly, has an argument as the best first overall pick of all time. There have been quite a few really good first overall picks in the last ten years, and we're going to get to that in a minute. But for me, I went with. Five cat. I went with five categories: games played, how healthy a guy is, their production, their counting stats, how good they are right now, how good they might eventually be, and whether or not they've lived up to the hype. Yeah, I've been in a similar boat. I'm looking at how they are right now, how they will be in the future, what they've done so far. I think that's also big for me. Those are the, honestly the main three that I've done, while also kind of diving into the underlying numbers a little bit. A little bit, excuse me, just, but just to go off what you said about Sidney Crosby, 100% agree and easily for me, top five player of all time. Yeah, I, I said it yesterday, but conservatively, he's the fifth best player of all time. And that's like if you want to go on the low end, I can definitely see an argument to put him above Bobby Orr. I can see an argument to put him above Gordy Howe. And you might be able to talk me into him having a better career than Mario Lemieux, even if Mario Lemieux was a better player. So with that in mind, we can start our actual conversation of today's episode. I will go first. Number 10. This isn't surprising. Uh, He doesn't have a whole lot of accomplishments. Did win the Stanley Cup this year. Won the call there as a rookie 10 years ago. But Aaron Ekblad was... Aaron Ekblad's ceiling never really was in play because of the injuries, the concussions, the multiple knee injuries. And it feels a little harsh to have him ranked lowest on this list, but someone does have to be ranked last. And his inability, his inability to stay healthy and really capitalize on that ceiling, you know, he's had a really solid NHL career. He's won a Stanley Cup. He's got the call there, like we said. But I just I don't see a way where I can put him above anyone else on this list. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, Nick, just looking at the counting stats overall, when I was doing some show prep for today, his best season overall came in 21-22, 15 goals, 57 points in 61 games. That's actually the only season he's had 50 plus points since coming into the league in 2014-15. Don't get me wrong. I think Aaron Ekblad is a very good defenseman. I think when he's playing his best hockey or when he's played his best hockey in the league, he's shown an ability at times to be a top 10 defenseman, but it just hasn't come out that much throughout his career. I mean, still 115 goals, 347 points. I still think he can be a very effective, good NHL defenseman and someone that can play on your top pairing. But when I look at some of the other guys on our list, I just think at least right now they're better and they have also the potential to be even better down the line as well. But that's no disrespect to Ekblad at all. I mean, heck, even this past season at 51 games, he only had four goals and 18 points. So I'm just a little a little bit worried after seeing how he played this past year, but I still think he's going to be very still at least good for years to come. It's crazy he's only 28 years old, yeah. you know. Some of these guys they when they crack in right away at 18, it, it really you lose track of how old some of these guys are. Like it feels like Tyler Myers should be like 45 years old, but somehow he's only 31. Like that just doesn't track in my brain for whatever reason. Uh, we can move along after Ekblad. Next up This one is tough because I had three guys with the exact same amount of points in my rubric. So I have Slavkovsky, Lafreniere, and Heischer all with 14 points in my rubric. I have Slavkovsky, lowest of the three, just because he's played the least. I think Slavkovsky has a real chance to be, I don't want to say Timo Meyer, but in that caliber of player where 30 to 40 goals, 60 to 70 points, if he's on a good team, he's probably the third or best forward on a Stanley Cup winning team. But a lot of that is optimism and projection as opposed to what he's shown so far. He came on really nicely 
down the backstretch of the regular season this year. Gave people cause for optimism. Montreal very clearly bought in. They gave him the long-term extension coming out of the ELC. I think Slavkovsky has a lot of potential, but I do think a lot of how he's going to be perceived going forward is ultimately going to be tied to whether or not Montreal can eventually be a good team. Like It's one thing to be a good player on a bad team, but if Montreal actually comes out of this rebuild with him and Reinbacker and all of the defensemen and Suzuki and Cole Caulfield, and they're genuinely competitive, then I think our perception of Slavkovsky is going to be really different. I think that's fair. This next one for me, it might be a hot take to some, so I'm kind of prepared for it. But I actually have Owen Power next on my list. Don't get me wrong. I think Owen Power is going to be very good for years to come. But just based on what he's shown so far, Nick, I mean, this past season, six goals, 33 points in 76 games. The year before that, four goals, 35 points in 79 games. It's not at the production that I want it to be for him to be a bit higher on this list. Don't get me wrong. He is going to be a very good number one defenseman for years to come. And I think this year we could see him, you know, crack the 50 to 60 point mark, but he just hasn't shown that ability yet. But I do think he's going to at some point, just because I really liked his underlyings this past year. I still think Darlene is better on the Sabres, which is why I have him above power right now. But if power is able to break out this year, maybe next year, you know, I might have to revisit this list a little further down the line, but I have power next to my list, but also just because Buffalo, man, it really is time for them to figure it yep. out. You have two bona fide studs on your blue line. You have some really good forwards. Three, up front and two. Byron too. Yes, 100%. It's, it's time for them to figure this out. You have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to like really high draft picks, you know, again, with power, Darlene, et cetera, et cetera. It's time for them to figure it out. But I have power next on my list. I know that's going to make ruffle some feathers, but I am prepared for the comments probably. That's fair. I, I think that's reasonable. I'm a little bit higher on power than yeah. you are because of the underlyings, but I feel pretty good about his trajectory as an individual. Next up, I have Lafreniere. Uh, it's taken a while. I think Lafreniere is getting there. I think the Rangers were probably the worst situation imaginable for a first overall pick to go into. I think both David Quinn and Gerard Gallant showed an inability to like empathize with other human beings and that's part of why Lafreniere really didn't get going until this past year having the fortuitous nature of riding shotgun with Panarin and Trocek helped a lot I think his perception again is going to really hinge on this year this is a walk year not a walk year but he goes to restricted free agency after this upcoming season and if he has the type of year that people think he's going to he's very much going to be in the conversation for that Slavkovsky type contract and I think the lasting memory of him being the only guy with a pulse in the conference finals really kind of sticks with me as he might not be the most talented guy on this list. There are a lot of guys ahead of him, but he has shown an ability to find a way to just make something happen in difficult environments. And that does count for something. I think there's an argument he can pass some of the guys ahead of him on this list, like pretty much all of these guys can where there's a lot of time for most of them. You know, Lafreniere's only like 23, 24 years old. He's got time. But I think for right now, the guys I have ahead of him are reasonable. Yeah, I have Lafreniere next on my list as well. It's funny. I was kind of thinking he was starting to be a bust with the Rangers just because he really wasn't performing that well. Heck, like, heck, as a rookie, only 12 goals, 21 points the next year. You know, only 10 more points, but he did have 19 goals. And then, heck, even the season after that, Nick, only had 39 goals. So everyone, 39 points, excuse me, 39 points in 81 games. So everyone was waiting for him to really take that big jump of the Rangers. And it felt like when they gave him that short-term contract before this season, Nick, it was like, okay, this is it. If you don't show that you can break through, we're going to move on with you. Well, he started to show that this year, 28 goals, 57 points, 82 games, finally living up to being the first overall pick in the 2020 NHL draft. And I do think he could have a similar type season for 24, 25. He's going to get top six minutes. I don't think it's going to be on the top line, but I think it's going to be on the second line. But with the way he played during the regular season, the way he played during the playoffs, I do think he can have a similar year, if not a bit of a better year. And I do think he has the ability to pass some of the other players on my list, especially maybe even someone like a year. Hey, who I have next on my list, but I do really think the future is, a lot brighter right now for Lafreniere than it was heading into the season. Because he heading into this past season, I didn't know if he was going to make it through that contract with the Rangers. It's a real testament to what confidence can do. He was not great last year. He was invisible in the playoffs against the Devils in that playoff yep. series. I don't think he had a. I don't think he had any. I think he had maybe one secondary assist, if that, in that series. But 
He got put in a better situation playing with better players on a, with a coach who was genuinely, I think you're good. We're going to find a way to make you comfortable and we're going to get more out of you. And it took a while, but the flashes were there this year that you can you can sell yourself on him continuing to improve. When we come back, we're going to keep making progress on our list. So be sure to stick around to this edition of Locked On NHL. It's summer. That means baseball, barbecues, concerts, the beach. And tonight, I am going to Action Bronson on Monday. I'm going to the Met game. The only place I buy tickets to go to concerts, to go to baseball games, is from our friends over at Game Time. With some of the best features in the ticket buying industry, things like zone deals, where you choose a section and let Game Time choose the seats, all in pricing, where they show you the total price up front with no surprise fees at checkout. The seat view, this is what's important for me. If I'm going to a baseball game, I want to be able to see home plate. I want to be able to tell balls and strikes without a telescope. So you can get a panoramic view from your seat in the app before you buy. The lowest price guarantee or game time will credit you 110% of the difference. And your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So take the guesswork out of buying baseball and concert tickets with game time. Download the game time app, create an account and use code locked on NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-H-L for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you for making Locked On NHL your first listen of the day. For your second listen, enjoy another national feed show like Locked On NFL or Locked On NBA to provide perspective on all things from the big leagues every single day with national experts and local insight on every team in the league. Available on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Okay, let's keep making progress. We're doing good on time for once when we're doing rankings. For once, we are not wildly bolliviating. Next up, I have Nico Heischer. Like I had said in my rubric, in my scoring, I had Heischer, Lafreniere, and Slavkovsky all with the same amount of points. Heischer, if he could stay healthy, I think he would be a lot higher on this list, but his constant feet and ankle injuries are a real cause for concern. When he's out there, he's one of the best two-way centers in the entire league. He was really, really good for them in that first round series against the Rangers last year that he entirely erased the Zbigniew Kreider line where they I want to say the shot share was something in the neighborhood of 65, 35. That's how good he sure is capable of being. It's just simply a matter of can he stay healthy and is he are his line mates going to give him enough opportunities to put up the counting stats? The player I have no question about. The counting stats and staying healthy are my questions for Heesher. I think that's pretty fair. I have Heesher a little bit higher on the list. It's funny. I kind of have Heesher, Dahleen, and Bedard almost in like the same quote unquote tier on my list. And then I have, you know, the three main ones a bit higher up. But that that's just a, a preview of what's to come, I, I guess, a little bit. But next up on my list, I do have Yuri Solkovsky of the Montreal Canadiens. Did not really have a good rookie season, only four goals and 10 points in 39 games. But this past year, he broke out in a big way. 20 goals, 50 points, 82 games, and the Canadians rewarded him for that season with a pretty big contract on July 1st, signing an eight-year deal, almost $61 million. They're that high on him, and I can see why, because again, he really broke out this year, and he's playing minutes with some of their top players. And I think with Montreal, if they want to get to where they want to go, which is obviously get back to the playoffs to become a contender, they're going to need Slavkovsky to you know, be even better. And I do think he has that ability considering what he did this past year. I am high on his future, but I'm also high on the Canadians future as well, because I really like what Kent Hughes is doing with this team. I like the quote unquote young core that the Canadians have amassed a little bit here. And I do think the time is near where they are going to be back in the playoffs. I'm not sure it's going to be this year, but I think it could be the year after. But what I'm looking for for Slavkovsky this year, maybe a 60 to 70 point season, continuing that trajectory of living up to the hype. But I was really high on him this year. And I think it's going to continue. I think it's going to continue for this upcoming season and beyond. Uh, his archetype is that Timo Meyer, Tomas Hurdle archetype of big, speedy, and has a decent finishing touch. You know, there are plenty of examples of guys with that type of size who don't really have the finishing to their game. He has shown an ability to have that to some degree. So it's really simply a matter of can he kind of capitalize on it and who he ends up playing with for the bulk of his time. Next up on my list, 
I have Owen Power. I am very bullish on a defenseman who has good underlying numbers on a bad team. I Anytime I see a defenseman who's got really high goals above replacement on a ba- actively bad team like the Sabres, I'm inclined to believe they're pretty good, especially defensively. He's big. He's really mobile for somebody who's six foot six. And in an ideal world, if the Sabres are going to be competitive, he's going to be the perfect number three defenseman, you know, where you have your first pair is going to be skewed towards trying to create offense. You're going to have him and hopefully a righty who has a defensive inkling to his game. And that's going to be your shutdown pair. That is going to be your when the game is on the line, we need dead we need this puck dead we need it out of our zone it's going to be him and someone else i am really optimistic about his trajectory just based on the traits there just aren't a lot of guys who are six foot six who skate that well especially as a defenseman and i think those traits if they get into a slightly better environment i think you're really going to see an explosion where him and Darlene are just going to be it's going to kind of be and this is a crazy comparison to make right now but it's gonna be like when shea weber and um Shea Weber and uh, Ryan Suter were on Nashville kind of energy. I can see that a little bit. It does sound a little bit nuts, but I, I can see where you're building towards. But let's keep the Sabres talk going a little bit because I have Rasmus Dahlin next on my list. I absolutely love this player, man. I mean, he had a little bit of a slow start to his career, but he has really figured it out. 20 yeah. goals, 59 points this past season. He had 73 points this season prior to that. He's a true number one defenseman in this league. And I honestly think the best could be yet to come for this player. I do think at some point in his career, I'll, I'll say this right now on the show, I think he's going to win a Norris at some point in his career. I, I think he's that good. And I know the Sabres, again, they haven't really figured it out just yet, but the way Darlene walks to the blue line, especially on the power play, is a sight to behold. The way he controls the puck on his stick, it's beautiful. The way he defends in his own zone, the way he's able to skate the puck out of danger also in his own zone. He is an absolute treat to watch. The only reason I have him right here on my list is because just the other players higher up on the list have just done a little bit more so far during their careers. But I still love Darlene and I really think the best is yet to come for him. He is a treat to watch on a nightly basis. Darlene is the last player we're going to be able to get in in this break. I have him next up on my list as well, checking in at number five. I think Darlene, I think the biggest problem for him, for Miro Heiskanen, for Charlie McAvoy, those guys is there are just so many good defensemen in today's NHL. Like, I think Darlene is Norris good, but he's also got to get past Fox and Hughes and McCarr and Heiskanen and McAvoy, and probably one or two other defensemen we're not thinking about that are going to get into this conversation over the next handful of years. It's it's a really crowded field. It's not like goalie, where there's like three actively good ones, and then the other five are all variable. There's a lot of really good defensemen in today's NHL, as we've seen the position kind of evolve to more of a, a fluid, positionless mindset of, I am actively part of the offense. You know, I didn't mention Evan Bouchard, who's going to put up crazy counting stats, which will get him into that conversation sometimes year after year. There are a lot of really good defensemen in today's league. I I genuinely believe Dalian is that capable of playing that level. I think similarly to a lot of these guys we've talked about, if that team is consistently good, he could put up some counting stats, run a power play. Yeah. I think then you'll see him get into that conversation. But until the Sabres are at least a playoff team, it's going to be hard for him to get into that awards consideration because it took, you know, Eric Carlson having the best counting stats season ever by, in the modern era by a defenseman for him to win it on an atrocity of a hockey team, Bam. you know. And I frankly didn't think he should have won the Norris on that really bad team. But nevertheless, Darlene, I think, I think the thing about Darlene that's exciting is he's already pretty good. And it still feels like there's room to keep getting better. And that's really what that's what you want from these guys you're picking at the top of the draft is the traits are there. You get the early deliverables and then we keep building out the team around you. And then eventually both are kind of lined up of he's ready to break out and the team is ready to break out. I think right now he still has the ability for me to be a top five defenseman in this league. I know there's so many great defensemen. I mean, we can go down the list, Nick, if you want at some point, obviously, but when I think he is playing his best hockey, he has the ability to be a top five defenseman in this league. And I think we can see that potentially this upcoming season if the Sabres are able to figure it out. But I'm just super high on this player and I'm excited to watch him a bit more this upcoming season as well. 
Very much so. The Sabres are going to be a fascinating experiment. Hunter and I are going to take one more quick break, wrap up the final four. Using your rules of deduction, you can figure out who the top four are for both of us. We will be right back. We're all driven by the search for better, but when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search. Match with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million monthly visitors, according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree. Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites, according to a recent Indeed survey. Indeed leverages over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day. Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. So the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash locked on. Just go to Indeed.com slash locked on right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash locked on. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Thank you to everybody who is hanging out on this Thursday edition of Locked On NHL. All right, Hunter, now we're getting into the big fish territory. Uh, I, I, It feels crazy to have Connor Bedard fourth, even though he has 60-ish NHL games, but it's so clear the talent's there. That's the thing. This is almost entirely projection. That team continues to get built out. It starts to get competitive. Maybe, as rumored, he does eventually switch to center from the wing, and that helps him. He's a top him. five player in the league this year. I don't know about that. It's I don't know. He, he's I, don't potential. Know. I don't think I can put him ahead of McDavid, Matthews, McKinnon, McCarr. That's I don't think I, I don't think I can put him ahead of any of those guys. And then Kucherov and Pasta. I think Bedard, I have, I started working on the top hundred players in the NHL list. I have Bedard at like 20 something. So like, I'm very bullish on his prospects. I think he's going to be very good. I think he's going to be, Probably a tier below Austin Matthews as far as goal scoring. He should be a consistent 40 goal guy for most of his NHL career. And we're talking about someone who is not of legal drinking age in the United States yet. I am very bullish on Bedard's prospects. I don't think he's going to be able to pass any of the three people ahead of him, which is also an interesting part of this conversation that I think if we have time, we should revisit at the end. But I have Bedard fourth. Just going off that i did want to get to my number five i don't think i got to my number five before the second yeah. break but nico he's your number five for yeah. me one of the best two-way forwards in the league i think he'll have a chance to win a selkie now that bergeron is out of the league but he's gonna have to be it out barkov i think each year which is still gonna be a bit tough but when healthy he can shut down a team's top line like it's like a piece of cake honestly i mean we saw what he did to the rangers in the first round of the playoffs during the 2022-23 season he had mika zabinajad and company in his back pocket during that series when he is healthy that is what he is capable of doing he can also bring the offense 67 points this past season but the big thing as you said nick it's his health but if he can stay healthy this upcoming season him and hughes together that team is a bona fide playoff team and a bona fide Stanley Cup contender in my eyes. He's your number five for me. Number four, I agree with you. Connor Bedard is number four for me. I know it may seem a bit weird for some pe- for people to for us to have Bedard at fourth, but that's how much I also like this player. Even on a bad Blackhawks team this past season, 22 goals, 61 points before winning the Calder. Heck, he even missed some time. So if he's fully healthy this season, I think he can definitely push 80 plus points and be a point per game player this year. He'll have more NHL talent to work with this year. And I do think the time is coming when he could be a top five player in the NHL. Maybe I was a bit bull, maybe a little too bullish this year on him being top five, but I do think the time is coming, Nick, where he's going to be a top five player in this league. That's how much I think of him as a great player so far. I agree that he's going to be one of the guys. I think he will very clearly be in that conversation. Uh, Next up for me, I have Jack Hughes. I think Jack Hughes, if he stays healthy, is very much a top 10 player in the world. It's simply a matter of health. He's missed a lot of games over his first few years in the league. But the breakout was obvious to anyone who watched him in that 56-game season. I watched a lot of the Devils that year because I was just curious about how his development was going, especially because Kakos was going so horrendously that I wanted to see if this was like a draft class thing and COVID impacting it, or if it was just Kako. And Hughes is 
Hughes is probably the second best, third best skater in the world. After McDavid, after McDavid and after McKinnon, I would say that Jack Hughes is probably the most dynamic skater with the puck on his stick. The, the one who's able to blow past defenders yeah. with the puck on his stick is a treat, man. I, I mean, he's done it to the Penguins so many times that I feel like I've lost count at this point. But when he's fully healthy and when he's going on the ice, there's really not many people that can stop him. Uh-oh. No. And that's really the thing. It's simply a matter of can he stay healthy yeah. and are the devils going to be good? It's a, it's very similar to Heischer. In the, the one year both of them were healthy, Hughes was a MVP candidate, Heischer was a Selkie candidate, and the team finished first or no, the team finished third in the division. If everyone stays healthy, the devils are going to be a scary team going forward because those guys are both still so young. You know, Jack Hughes is 23, 24 years old. He's got a lot of time and maybe he figures it out as far as managing his body. So he's not dinged up as much. But when he's healthy, there are very few players in the league I'm taking before him. 100%. I also do think when healthy, he is a top 10 player in the league. And yes. we saw that, Nick, during the 22-23 season, 99 yeah. points in that season, and also helped the Devils beat the Rangers in the first round of the playoffs. He was great in that series. I really do feel like the sky is the limit with him. I think if he's healthy this year, he can hit over 100 plus points. He For has sure. that type of talent overall in this NA, in the NHL. Excuse me. And I do think now with a new coach coming in, with he sure hopefully healthy. Just overall, when you look at that Devils team, he 1 million percent has the ability to hit 100 plus points. The, so- the sky is the limit for him. I'm really excited for him going forward. Number two for me, Austin Matthews, the best pure goal scorer in the NHL right now. You knew he was going to be special from the moment he scored four goals in his first NHL game. When I saw that, I'm like, yeah, he is very much living up to the hype and he has continued to live up to the hype throughout his career. And I'll say this as well. He's not at the point yet but he's going to have the chance to be the best American born player in, in NHL history. If he continues to do this right now, I would say the best American born player in league history is Patrick Kane. But if Matthews is able to keep up this production and maybe win a championship or two, I think he's going to pass Kane by the end of his career. Nick, I think in watching them Kane, it's hard because Kane's more of a facilitating playmaker dynamic type, whereas Matthews is just give me the puck. I'm going to put it in the net. So comparing them as far as like dominance and like just watching them is a little bit tricky. Yeah. But I do think Matthews is more, I think explosive is the word because he's a little bit bigger. He's more physically imposing. He's shown an ability to get a little nasty when needed to. I think with Matthews and Matthews is two for me as well. His defense doesn't get enough consideration. Yeah. He's better defensively than McDavid. He's better defensively than McKinnon. It's simply a matter of the other guys put up more points because they facilitate on top of scoring goals, whereas Matthews is, give me the puck and I'll score. I mean, he had 70 goals. That that just, we're talking stupid at this point. Yeah, that's His something. release is also disgusting. Yeah, he's the best pure goal scorer in the world. Yeah. I think he's going to be, I think he's going to end up being considered more talented than Patrick Kane. It's just simply a matter of if the resume matches up. You know, Kane's got a Conn Smythe. He's got the three cups. He's got an Olympic silver. It's simply a matter of if Matthews can get enough accolades. But physically talented, I am inclined to take Matthews. And if you look at Matthews' production also, I do think if he's able to keep this up for many, many seasons. Oh, he's going to have a chance. Yeah, I I was. you knew where I was going. He's going to have a chance to pass Ovechkin Ovechkin. when he eventually breaks the goal record. Because I do think Ovechkin is going to break it before he retires. But Oh, I think Ovechkin is going to keep playing until he breaks it. I I don't think he cares how long it takes. Oh, 100%. I completely agree. But I do think if Matthews keeps up this production, I think he'll have an ability to break Ovechkin's record once he eventually breaks Gretzky's record. For sure. Uh, McDavid's first. I don't think that's a surprise. Yes. Um, is there anything Matthews could do to pass McDavid in your mind? Because I, I, that's the question I've been asking for three off seasons now. Is there anybody who can get close? You know, McKinnon can get close. Matthews can get close. Is there anything either of those guys could do to be considered better than Connor McDavid? Or is it just simply we're watching the best to ever do it? And that's the end of the conversation. See, yeah, I don't know, because like the way McDavid also is a great skater, I actually think he's a better skater than Matthews and obviously Hughes. But the way he skates, the way he's so crafty with the puck on his stick. Yeah, McDavid has a great release as well. I mean, he's not as great of a goal scorer as Matthews is, but just the playmaking ability that he has compared to Matthews, it puts him over the top. Yeah, he might not also have the defense that Matthews does, but just when you look at the offense that he produces year after year, I mean, Nick, 
five Art Ross trophies, four Ted Lindsay's, three hearts. You have a Con Smythe when the Oilers didn't even win the Stanley Cup. He also has a Rocket Richard. I mean, at this point, I mean, he might already be a top 15 player of all time with everything he's done in the NHL so far. He has the potential, it has the potential to grow even higher, especially if he's able to lead the Oilers to one Stanley Cup, if not multiple Stanley Cups. But I think in terms of Matthews passing him, I don't know, man. I, I really, right now, I don't see it. I agree. I, I was just curious. I've conducted this exercise a lot over the last few years because that was always the conversation. You know, there will eventually be a next guy, but yeah. what does that guy look like? You know, I, I've had this conversation, same thing in football. You know, if you were trying to make the better Patrick Mahomes, what would it be? You know, like three inches taller, 20 pounds heavier. If he was Josh Allen, but Mahomes good, that, that Josh Allen size, but Mahomes good, I don't think you're going to see anything comparable to what McDavid is for a while. And, you know, that's what makes guys like that so special. And where would you say of, he ranks in NHL history so far? Where would right you- now, I think he's probably, in terms of talent, he's top five. Yeah. I think in terms of resume, he's probably 15th. I mean, I got to go and look. You know, I don't know how many multiple time mm-hmm. Hart Trophy winners there are, multiple Art Ross trophies there are. And, you know, you got to era adjust and compare mm-hmm. the guys who played in the 50s to the guys who played in the 90s to the guys who played in the 70s. It's all interesting. It's good conversation for this time of the year because it makes you think and makes you active. But that will do it for today's edition of Locked on NHL. Thank you for making it your first listen of the day. Now go check out the Locked on NFL, NBA, or MLB podcast where the season never ends and provides national expertise with local flavor. You can find the link to Locked on Sports in the description so you don't need to search. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hunter and I will see you guys next week.